We turn to Mark in chapter 15 and the closing verses of this chapter, which we have read together this evening and thinking of the three hours of dusk from three o'clock in the afternoon. And you see how Mark mentions in verse number 42, when evening had come, six o'clock in the evening. One of the few dates that probably many of us, all of us remember is 1066, that battle of Hastings when William the Conqueror took on King Harold and overcame King Harold. And on the battlefield, it seems, King Harold was killed with an arrow through his eye, as many tapestries and pictures have portrayed but, but then the, the story becomes a, a little less clear. What happened then to the king and, and how uh, was he treated after this? And some stories have that he was buried in, in honor on, on a hilltop. Other stories have that his mother, Githa, uh, offered uh, William the Conqueror uh, the, the, the weight of her son's body and gold if he would return his body to her, something he didn't do. William the Conqueror's alleged proposal was that the body was thrown into the sea. But there are many tales then and suggestions and proposals and evidence is collated for, for, for describing and understanding that very important element of the king. What happens to his body? And, and we come in this third segment of the greatest day of history just to think of this, this very point, the burial of our Lord and Savior. And we've been thinking of the, the important segments in, in this greatest day that those three hours of daylight when uh, the, the, the wine, the sour wine was, was offered to Jesus as, as an opiate and he refused uh, to take this. When the title was placed uh, above the cross in red or, or, or black letters claiming he was the king of the Jews. Uh, when the mockers the passers-by, the scribes and Pharisees, the, the two robbers crucified at his side, mocked and ridiculed the Savior, but spoke more than they, they realized he saved others. Himself he cannot save. And we thought today of the three hours of darkness, those elements within that three hours of crucifixion on the cross, the cloud that, that blotted out the, the, the sunlight for a prolonged period and brought a symbolic darkness down upon that scene of Calvary, of the cry that Jesus utilized from Psalm 22, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he entered into our place and absorbed the, the wrath of God against our sins. And that veil which was rent in two from the top to the bottom, Mark says, this divine action, this supernatural intervention, indicating the temple would be destroyed, showing that the ceremonial laws were ended, but primarily proclaiming, as the book of Hebrews latches onto, that the way is open for us to come through the blood of Christ to worship and praise and serve and commune with the living triune God. And we come then to this third segment which Mark sets out for us from three o'clock in the afternoon to the evening, six o'clock in the evening. And in this section we, we have these three groups or, or three parties uh, which are, are identified uh, by the writer uh, and held up for our emulation as he records for us uh, the burial of the Lord Jesus. The first group that we're thinking of is, is the centurion, the, the Gentile. And then we think of Joseph, the Jew, 
And, and then we think of the, the Marys and Salome, the woman, the Gentile, the Jew, the woman. And what's brilliant about this account, as, as we find throughout Scripture and throughout Mark's Gospel, is that, that each one of them are unusual. Each one of them are rare. Each one of them are unexpected. A Roman centurion proclaiming the divinity of Jesus. This shy member of the Sanhedrin begging for the body of Jesus, whom the Sanhedrin has condemned. And then women who are peripheral in first century society, playing such a crucial part as witnesses of the Son of God. Let's think of the first party then, or person, uh, the, the centurion in, in verse uh, number 39. When the centurion the Roman centurion in charge of a hundred soldiers who stood facing him saw in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. We discuss the sermon at, at dinner time and sometimes the discussion is better than others. And, and maybe, maybe you do that and maybe sometimes you, you, you're struggling to, to ascertain what the point of the sermon was. What was the, the dominant theme and idea that was being attempted to be put across from that particular passage? Perhaps as you bite into your chips, it's still all a fog in your mind. But this is not the case in Mark's gospel. His message is crystal clear. He begins in his first verse by saying, this is the gospel about Jesus, the Son of God. He sets out his stall right at the beginning. This is a Christology from above. Jesus is the Son of God sent down from heaven. And throughout his gospel, this theme is recurring and it's leading up to this high point to a human being, the only person in the gospel of Mark who makes this announcement, which we're all to emulate. This man was the son of God. That's where Mark wants us to come. The place we're to arrive at. This man was the son of God. Now, Calvin, Calvin maintains that this Roman centurion wasn't truly converted in, in this instance, that, that this was a, a momentarily witness, a momentary witness to the divinity of Christ. So it's along the lines of the Roman centurion, the, the, the Roman soldiers, the Roman people, eh, ascribing divinity to the emperor. Or along the lines of the, the Grecians who, who considered uh, rulers to be demigods. But, but I think we probably would maybe see it differently, wouldn't we? That this is a, a sincere and life-transforming confession from this Roman centurion. See the language of verse 39. He stood facing him. When he saw that in this way he breathed his last, he'd heard the, the words from the cross, the, the cries of dereliction here and, and the others recorded in the other gospels of triumph and committing his spirit into the hands of his father. He'd witnessed every response of Christ to the mockery that had come to him. He'd seen many crucifixions. His role was to oversee the execution of criminals at this site outside of Jerusalem. He'd stood there many times. But this man, this man is different. This man is the son of God. seen the supernatural phenomenon that had come to the death of Christ. The heavens mourning in their darkness. 
the earthquake rumbling beneath their feet. He'd never experienced such a crucifixion like this. There's something more going on than, than, than human punishment and, and death here. This man is the Son of God. Perhaps, and more than likely, he had been in the discussion at the Sanhedrin. He had heard or it had been reported to him how they had questioned Jesus and, and, and sought to discern his being. And verse 61 says in 14, chapter 14, again the high priest asked him, are you the Christ? The son of the blessed. What a question this is. What a direct question to Jesus. And his answer is direct. Jesus said, verse 62, I am. And with those words ringing in his ears, with the added changes in nature all around him, with this personal viewing of the way that Jesus dies, he says, truly, this man was the son of God, a Gentile, a Roman centurion, a hardened soldier. And yet the grace of Christ, it seems, reaches down into his soul and changes him. In that moment, the spirit enlightens the understanding of this man. And he says what we all need to say, this man the Son of God. And we need to say it because only in saying it do we have redemption. Only someone truly human and truly divine could effect the atonement of our sin, could absorb into himself the infinite wrath of God against our sin. Truly, this man was the son of God. Prince Harry keeps talking about this bodyguard issue, doesn't he? And the, the UK government funding this bodyguard issue when he, when he comes over here. He is important. He, he belongs to the royal family. He needs a bodyguard. You and I, don't we drive to church? We walk to church. We cycle to church. We, we don't have a whole retinue of people defending us. But, but he has an added value and so needs this, this protection. But he's only human. Christ is greater. And the centurion gets this. This man the son of God did it cost them to say that <laughs> the, 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 the four man execution group that he, he oversaw cackle but what, what, was it, what's he saying now he's losing it up there it's all getting to him this, this dark clouds and, and, and this, this earthquake he's, he's lost it did it cost him to say that in the presence of his peers? Was he the object of ridicule and of doubt and of mockery, making this verbal public confession, truly this man is the son of God, and it might cost us to say to our work colleagues, Jesus is more than man. He's the son of God the Savior that my darkened heart needs. And it will cost us in our life of discipleship to, to acknowledge him practically as the Son of God, that his rules, his laws, his requirements, his ethics will be followed by me and not the world's ethics for us to acknowledge and live out practically that Jesus is the Son of God with authority over my life brings a cost, a price, a challenge to our experience. But here he is. One to be emulated. An unlikely candidate to be a professor of the true identity of Christ. 
But such is the, the grace of God. Such is the surprises which heaven brings. The Roman centurion said, truly, this man was the son of God. And we say it too. The second group then, uh, or person, is, is a Jew. The, the, the Joseph, uh, well-respected, powerful, influential, a member of the, 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 the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, that powerful body which uh, governed uh, the Jews, which had tried Jesus, uh, which had concluded uh, that he was guilty of death. But, but Joseph belonged to that group and he did not uh, consent uh, to their conclusion and their sentence of Jesus. He lived primarily in, in Ramah, a city 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem, but, but spent a, a lot of his time in the city of Jerusalem. He was influential, he was wealthy, he was well known. And he begs for the body of Jesus. There's, there's, a, there's a, a special word in verse 43 uh, you can see it here. He took courage. He took courage. There's this moment that he steps out of the shadow. He'd been a follower of Christ. He'd seen Christ in his years of ministry. He'd become a disciple of Christ. John says secretly, but, but there's this moment. He nails his color to the mast. Crosses over the Rubicon took courage. And in a public way, he goes to Pilate and he begs for the body of Jesus. And everything was against him. He was a Jew. And Pilate hated the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin had tormented Pilate and forced him into a corner and brought about this sentence of crucifixion on Jesus. He wasn't a relative of, of Jesus. And Jesus had been crucified for, for the accusation of treason. And usually such a, a solemn accusation required that the government retained the body and buried it in a, a, an ignominious ceremony in a common grave. Everything was against them. But such was his love, his respect, his devotion to Jesus Christ that he, he steps out of the shadow, he takes courage and he goes to Pilate. And he begs the body of Jesus. There was no one else to ask for Jesus' body. The apostles had fled. Joseph does this. And we see the, the careful way uh, that, that, that this is dealt with uh, in these verses, in verse number 46. The, the, the normal pattern of the, the Jewish burial of, of washing and wrapping in, in linen and, and spices and laying with the help of his servants and Nicodemus the body of Jesus in a tomb. Calvin, and we're, we're more in line with Calvin on this point, he, he talks about the, the change that's happening here in the history of redemption. The curse is finished. Jesus has made atonement. The curtain of the temple has been rent. And now God steps in. Now he steps in. And looks after the body of Jesus. And he drives and motivates and empowers. And grants success to Joseph. In securing Christ's body. The body is important. God, as he cared for the body of Jesus and brought it to life again, will, will care for ours too and, and bring it to life once more. But what's incredible in this action of Joseph is there was nothing in it for him. What was in it for him? 
begging this body, securing this body, bearing this body. What was in this for Joseph of Arimathea? It was pure devotion, pure love, pure care for Jesus that drove him. And what a challenge to us. Think of David providing for Mephibosheth, getting him to eat at his table every day. What was in that for King David? It was pure grace towards that man. We struggle with that, don't we? I, I do. We'll buy cream buns for our boss, but we'll not buy it for our work colleagues. What good can they do to us? We'll care for those who perhaps will, will remember us when they've gone and, and provide something for us. But those who are elderly and, and cannot provide anything for us, perhaps we struggle to put up with their idiosyncrasies. But here is Joseph. Stepping out of the shadows, taking courage and looking after the burial of Christ. And then the third group uh, are the women who are, are mentioned uh, in our verses here. At the last verse, uh, the, the account finishes uh, with them and they're mentioned in verse number 40 as well. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. And again, this is a surprising group. The Roman centurion is a surprising person to make that confession, Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin who condemned Christ, that is surprising. And so too is, is the mention of the woman here in these crucial places. And, and the reason why it's surprising is that in for century society, the witness of women was not accepted in a court of law. So if any evidence was required in a court of law, it would all come from males Woman's testimony, woman's witness was not admissible in a court of law. But in Mark's gospel, within the church and the ethics of the church and the ethos of Jesus, it's women who are witnesses of his death in verse number 40 and of his burial in verse number 47. And of his resurrection in chapter 16, verse 1, the same three women, Mary, Mary, and Salome, they see his death. They see his burial. They see his resurrection. And this adds authenticity to the account. If he had said, Peter, James, and John saw Jesus die, Jesus buried, Je Jesus uh, resurrected, it's not as strong as I'm saying it was woman. Who saw him die. It was woman who saw the place of his burial. It was Mary, Mary and Salome who saw him resurrected. They were there when the apostles were. And the challenge still comes to the, the Christian church today. That often there are more women at church and more women involved in the church than men. Why is that? I'm sure studies have been done and, and research has, has been conducted. Why is that often the case? Is it a, a gender thing? Is it a personality thing? Or, or, or is it that men... Do not grasp the opportunities. Do not commit themselves as women do. But they saw him die. They saw him buried. They saw him in his resurrection. And we believe their witness. We believe that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus is risen again. 
and it impacts us and it changes our life and it affects us. Yes, we accept 1066 and, and the Battle of Hastings and, and, and though the, the, the burial of King Harold is, is undefined and, and indistinct, we have this inspired account of the burial of our Saviour of his resurrection and it brings us hope and it brings us assurance of forgiveness and it brings us purpose to live and it brings us an anticipation beyond this world here are three groups pulled in here by Mark the Gentile the Jew the woman as witnesses to Christ so as we reflect on this last segment of three hours of the greatest day let us serve our savior what a what a mixture of people serving him and witnessing for him here a jew and a gentile men and women there is the opportunity for for each of us for all of us to be witnesses for our lord we are called to serve him and speak for him wherever we are but I think the chapter also, or the section, also challenges us to, to, to grasp the moment. Perhaps there's some particular type of service that is needed at this moment in our life, in our family, in our church, in our community. Yes, it was great for these women to, to serve Christ in their homes in their marriages, in their families, but there was a, a particular, a niche, an outstanding opportunity to serve Christ in the burial of the Savior. Perhaps in the world today, it's the need for the Bible to be translated into languages that have no part of Scripture. Perhaps it's the need for theological education among leaders in African churches. Perhaps those are dominant needs in our time that we should pray about and work towards. Perhaps in our denomination, the, the striking need is vacancies within the denomination and the need for more men for the ministry. And we grasp the opportunity to pray about this and to encourage men into this. Perhaps in our congregation there are outstanding needs that, that can be met. Ways in which we can serve Christ. Yes, it's good to be faithful in our marriages, to be careful in our oversight of our family. But beyond that, within the church, there are opportunities which come once in a blue moon to grasp and lay hold of. And, and Joseph grasps it. And Mary and Mary and Salome grasp that fleeting opportunity to serve Christ. Let us not only serve him, let us not only serve him in the moment, but let us serve him in the position that he's given to us. The centurion served Christ in his position. He had a position of authority. He was a leader. He had men under him. He had control. He had the opportunity to influence others. And he takes it publicly. Before them, before all, he announces the divinity of Christ. The woman, perhaps they had more time, more opportunity more skills, more gifts, more experience. It was the, the woman's task in first century society to, to embalm the dead. And, and, and no doubt they'd been involved in this from their earliest days and had experience there. And they used that craft to serve Christ in this moment. And Joseph was unique. He had authority. He had clout. He had influence. He had reputation, as the text says, within Jerusalem. He was known. He, he was a figure of importance. And he used that to beg for the body of Jesus. Reflect on our position. What we have, what we bring to the table, what unique talents and gifts we possess to serve 
our Savior. And lastly, let us serve him when things seem hopeless. Isn't this the incredible thing here? The Roman centurion makes this announcement of Christ who's just died. This is the Son of God. He he must have been wrestling with this. This is the Son of God and yet he's dying. Joseph, begging for the body of Jesus, buries him in his sepulchre thinking, I'll never see him again. He was waiting for the kingdom, the text says, and, and, and in verse 43, and, and in his mind, the, the kingdom included this, this almighty overthrow of the Romans and the restoration of Judaism to its pinnacle of power. He, he had this political ambition and vision which wasn't realized now, and it's hopeless for him. And the woman with tears and sympathy bury the Lord. They serve him. Their hearts have no hope or understanding that in three days everything will have changed. In 50 days The Spirit will be poured out and the apostles will be heading off into the ends of the world and and the new covenant will be in full force. They serve him unaware of what's just over the hill. And in our service for Christ, there are times when it's difficult to serve, when there's little encouragement when it seems hopeless, fruitless, pointless. But we don't know God's purposes. What lies just ahead of us in his grace and in his plan. The three hours of daylight, what hours they were. The three hours of darkness. The three hours of dusk. And the soldier and Joseph and the woman served their Lord.